Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started with our meeting today on applied NMR methodologies for polymer understanding. At this point, I'm going to drive it over to David Rice. Okay, welcome everyone. And uh, to our whatever meeting we're up to. Um, and uh, we have a great meeting today about uh, polymers. And before we get started, John Webb, our sponsor, uh, from MR Resources is not present today, but I'd like to hand things right back to Eric and so that he can display um, a small video of John. Thank you, Dave, and uh, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, <laughs> good evening, wherever you may be. And uh, I think this is Ivan meeting number 36. Oh, oh, God, what's that wrong? We are a little uh, Zoom online experiment for uh, well over a couple of years now. Uh, uh, once again, uh, great uh, uh, subject material today. Uh, we've got a very, very good uh, uh, panel lined up and uh, looking forward to it. Uh, MR Resources and uh, Q1 Instruments are uh, very happy to uh, be bringing the uh, uh, Ivan meetings to you. And uh, MR Resources, of course, have been around for uh, over 35 years at this point and uh, providing uh, uh, reconditioned uh, NMR systems, magnets, consoles, probes, uh, service contracts, quench magnet recovery, and uh, certainly moving and uh, relocation. Uh, in fact, uh, they've got a very impressive inventory uh, of reconditioned instruments on hand, and uh, uh, three in particular, a uh, very spectacular offering, uh, all Brooker Avance 3, 600, 700s, and uh, they've even got a, a 950. Uh, in inventory at this point, uh, all with uh, uh, cryoprobes. Uh, certainly uh, check them out, get in touch uh, uh, if any of these uh, interest you. And uh, Q1 Instruments, a little bit uh, uh, newer to the industry, but uh, Eric, could you uh, give us some uh, uh, brief information on Q1, please? Well, thank you, guys. Uh, just want to say Q1 is dedicated to providing a range of hardware and software to make routine NMR more accessible. Our product consists of complete 400 megahertz systems with magnets manufactured by Q1, complete systems at 400 to 600 megahertz using refurbished magnets, console upgrades three to 600 in both economy and full upgrades. And we also provide smart tune and match probes for existing worker invariant systems. Everyone knows that the probe is key to the performance of a system and the smart tune and match are robust hybrid tuning mechanisms with faster tuning, unmatched reliability and improved throughput. It's a patented design free of drift and hysteresis with excellent signal and noise and made in a variety of configurations at 400 megahertz. We also offer, uh, Happy to introduce a new uh, variable temperature unit that can be adapted to both Q1 and uh, Brooker Invariant systems for providing minus 20 degree air. And if you wanna learn more about Q1, contact us for a no risk remote demonstration. Thank you. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about upcoming meeting uh, before we start today. As many of you recognize, uh, during our ENC user conference, we had some technical difficulties. And so uh, remote attendees could not be present and a couple of our speakers uh, couldn't uh, present. They were supposed to be remote um, speakers. So we decided to do uh, an Ivan meeting uh, on August uh, 4th as a follow-up. Um, and those two speakers will uh, be presenting more like a webinar type. Uh, the first talk would be Yu Wu at the uh, University of Georgia. He will give a talk on automatic, automatic NMR special decomposition through computational fitting of time domain signals. And then the second talk would be uh, Gary Martin, uh, Seton Hall uh, University. He will present a uh, Ivan, our presentation, humorously titled, and I am not paraphrasing this, we don't know what the hell he is going to say. <laughs> that's the title. Um, so with that, uh, that's the next, in three weeks from now, 
then we have um, a few more topics that are coming down the pike uh, to wrap up 2022. We have two part series on industrial application of benchtop NMR, one in September, another one in November. Uh, both will be uh, led by Travis Gregor at uh, 3M. And um, in between that, uh, that um, would be uh, NOVA sequences by Tim Claridge. Uh, that will be in October. And then we have um, Murali Nagarajan from Rutgers uh, doing an introductory bio NMR uh, in December. Um, so the dates would come through very soon. We haven't finalized exact dates yet. Uh, we're very close to finalizing it. So we'll be announcing that soon. As far as the ENC talks are concerned, they should be available soon uh, in our YouTube channel. The ENC user conference talks that were presented on that day in April will be soon available. With that, I will pass it back to Dave. Okay, thank you, Chris. Um, on our next meeting uh, subject, going back to that, I think that even though that we have such a vague title, we can be certain that Gary's going to have something good to say. <laughs> the um, what what I'd like to do for about three minutes before we get started is um, mention something. If you have not heard it already, is a sad thing, and that is if you know Jake Jacob Schaefer, Jake Schaefer um, has passed away. Uh, on June 27th of this year, and uh, which is unfortunate. Jake was a very uh, prominent member of the NMR community, and in particular, the community of NMR of polymers, uh, as well as biomolecular and other NMR solid state techniques. Um, and Jake, uh, and so it's, it's sad that he's passed away. Uh, the most, if you don't, know who Jake is. Um, his major uh, work uh, in 1976 was to introduce the uh, technique of cross-polarization magic angle spinning uh, to uh, the area of NMR of polymers. And he, uh, and he started out that with a paper, C13 NMR of polymers spinning at the magic angle where he showed a polysulfone, a piece of wood, and a cutout of an ivory billiard ball, which is mostly collagen. And that got started really the, um, the very important use of CP mass that has continued in the polymer area uh, ever since. Uh, some other, con uh, Jake Schaefer has managed to first do many of the most important things that we do in the solid state NMR area. Uh, he introduced the concept of double cross polarization between carbon and nitrogen, and which um, is now used extensively in biosolids NMR, uh, studying uh, solid state proteins and membranes. And he then later with uh, Terry Gillian um, introduced the concept of rotational echo double resonance, uh, which is a measure way of measuring uh, dipolar couplings between carbon and nitrogen, uh, so-called REDOR, um, which is a fundamental part of almost every modern uh, biological sequence now using solids. Um, one of the things that he worked on all of his career, uh, probably starting from his initial uh, work with CP mass, was, was the study of local order in otherwise random coil polymers. And he spent many years of his life um, uh, doing experiments for himself to prove, uh, at doing experiments to uh, prove that uh, local order did exist in, in, in such systems. And um, actually I don't have it to show here, but I can look it up for anyone interested. But his last paper was, um, was a, uh, was a uh, summary or a, uh, a, a full description of his work in that area. So anyway, I would like to, uh, let's all remember Jake Schaefer. He was a good friend to a lot of us. 
And so with that, I think uh, I'll pass things on to uh, Jacqueline. Excellent, thank you, Dave. Okay. Um, all right, so we will begin with the portion. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. All right, so today we will be focused around the area of applied NMR methodologies for polymer understanding. Um, po understanding polymer-based systems in solutions, dispersions, and solids, it's not an easy task, right? So this workshop is really gonna focus on methodologies that we've used to study various polymers. I will take you through two simple examples of how I've used NMR to characterize and understand various polymers that are related in the consumer goods industry at PNG. And because PNG is very private, it will be very limited in details due to restrictions on information sharing. Um, but after that, we'll hear from Lou Madsen, professor of the Department of Chemistry and Macromolecules Innovation Institute at Virginia Tech. His talk is entitled Understanding Molecular Partitioning and Transport in Polymeric Systems. And so his group really focuses on developing new ways to measure a range of phenomena in heterogeneous or complex systems. They often use intermediate state NMR spectroscopy and diffusometry uh, in conjunction with other analytical techniques to study the systems. And then last we'll hear from uh, Ben Rainier at the Dow Chemical Company. Uh, his talk is entitled Non Fourier NMR Techniques Optimized for Polymeric Systems. And he will focus on practical app, uh, <laughs> approaches to optimizing non Fourier NMR methods towards the analysis of polymeric materials. All right, so with that, we'll go ahead and get started with my talk. So, um, First off, uh, my name is Jacqueline uh, Thomas. I work at Procter & Gamble. I often go by Jackie. Um, I first wanna say thank you to the Ivan Planning Committee for this invite and this opportunity to be part of this panel today. Um, a little bit about me is I received my PhD in physical organic chemistry under Dan Singleton at Texas A&M. Um, so I'm not a traditional NMR spectroscopist, but I did a lot of NMR spectroscopy in graduate school. Um, then I made my way to PNG, and um, that's where I am today. So who is PNG? Many people really don't know the parent company, but you may be familiar with a lot of our brands, our big popular brands, such as Tide, Charmin, Dawn, Mr. Clean, Swiffer. Um, and in all of these products, not only the packaging contains polymers, but we often use soluble polymers for a lot of our key delivery mechanisms for our products. We also have to make sure that, you know, we can make a product, it can be shelf stable, it can uh, survive transportation from a plant to a grocery store, it can last on that, that grocery store until a consumer purchases it, and then it has to last in the consumer's house, right? During the life of use. And that's not even talking about the performance of the product. So for example, if we think about Dawn, right? We have to make Dawn, we have to formulate it. We have different suppliers supplying different ingredients. It has to be phase stable. Nobody's gonna wanna buy a, a bottle that's separated in terms of its ingredients. Um, once it survives transport, gets purchased, has to go into the house, which is a very different environment, different temperature um, than what it's seen in the past. And then it has to be used. And think about its use, right? You dilute it in a matter of maybe seconds to minutes, and you want it to work really fast on whatever you're trying to clean. So it has to perform, right? And so we're constantly looking at the formulation thinking about how can we deliver a consumer desired experience because we want to help make your job of cleaning easier, right? Um, we want to make sure that you get the best performance out of our product because if you're going to be paying money, we, we know that that's an expectation. So that's kind of the, some of the thinking behind a lot of our products and a lot of the reasons why we study all, almost all of our products and their ingredients really in depth. So first off, polymer structure characterization. 
So one of the polymers that we use in a lot of our products is polyvinyl alcohol, AKA PVA, PVOH. Very simple polymer, right? You have um, typically the way that it is manufactured or made, do you use vinyl acetate, you take that through a radical polymerization to make the polyvinyl acetate, then that's subjected to a hydrolysis uh, reaction to make the polyvinyl alcohol. Very simple, but it's not. And what is important for PNG is, well, you could have different molecular weights of polyvinyl alcohol, which impact their solubility. You could have different molecular distributions of polyvinyl alcohol. And so when we're talking about a process that requires high molecular weight material, and if there's a distribution of low molecular weight coming in, that can impact the product's performance. And we really need to understand that. We can have different degrees of hydrolysis and that impacts their solubility, right? So, so if we're talking the difference between 75, 80, 85, 90, that could be a huge spectrum in terms of of its solubility and compatibility with our other additives. And then these polyvinyl alcohols that are made by suppliers, they could come in with different additives. They could be copolymers, they could be polymer blends. And so for that reason, we really try to characterize the heck out of these polymers. And so just in general, very simple. Proton and MR um, is one of the leading ways to characterize and calculate the degree of hydrolysis. You can see the, uh, see, um, the, uh, the H alphas and the H betas really nicely. You can see the CH3 um, that's bound to the ester that's on the material, you can do quick integrations. It's all in the literature, very simple. You can even determine the amount of free acetate. People are often asking, well, is the supplier adding some other different ingredient? So if it's an organic molecule, we can usually spot that really nicely and characterize um, it very well. We also do other in-depth characterizations, especially on polymers. So if we think about the way that the structure is orientated. So are these acetate groups uh, just distributed throughout? Is there a neighbor to neighbor type of, of uh, arrangement or what people call blockiness, right? So we also try to understand that because that also impacts the way that the polymer might be processed or the way that that polymer might perform. And so just to give you an example, you know, here are um, two, four, six, six different lots of various PVOHs that we've screened over the past that I just kind of stacked together. And you can see, we see a wide range of different degrees of hydrolysis. And these are used in different products based on their degree of hydrolysis to meet the different needs of that product or of that processing of, of the material. So that's just one way we characterize our raw materials. Um, we do a lot, a lot of characterization of polymers. Another thing that we often do with NMR is we try to understand what the polymers are doing, whether that's in um, compatibility of the product or in the performance vectors of the product. And so often we use polymer diffusion. And so as this group probably knows Callahan, he had a great paper in, in 1981 that talked to the link between diff diffusion and the molecular weight of a, a, of a polymer system. And so um, we set out to kind of reapply this methodology within our lab, doing diffusion on the polymers um, that he had reported. We wanted to make sure that, you know, we could replicate his work because one of the important things for us is, you know, to understand molecular weight distribution, but then another piece of it is um, about once you reach a certain amount of molecular weight, now you enter a range of entanglement. And so here were some standards we had low to high um, at various concentrations. And so that, that's where the key question was about if a polymer system that we're interested in, is it really entangling? right? Or is it just a concentration vector where they're just all aligned? And so um, really trying to get after this entanglement and it, it was really nicely explained. And, and I think, um, it, not think, but it has been reapplied over the years 
in various groups where you can measure different concentrations of a polymer at a molecular weight and it has a really nice slope. And then once that slope is broken, now you've entered the entanglement regime where these polymers are now like bound and, and looped around. Um, and that can be contributed uh, various factors of polymers. And so um, we had a product we had a product that was looking at a new series of polymers and they had a low molecular weight and a high molecular weight. They want it to flow um, when the product is actually first used, but then they want it to kind of gel after the fact. And so the question was, you know, which molecular weight should they really be using? Because they know they can trigger this change as a function of pH. And so here's some intrinsic rheology curves using a rolling ball viscometer. Um, the polymers at two different molecular weights, various concentrations. So this is percent by weight on the bottom and at two different pHs. And so we also took these points and we measured the diffusion on them. And sure enough, we can definitely see that transition between, you know, where they are um, they might be loopy, but they're very single and flowable. But then as you uh, increase the concentration and even change their pH, you can see that they start to kind of agglomerate or entangle with each other, which th then does slow them down quite a bit as the measured observed diffusion uh, was done. And so we were able to combine this into like a model where we know polymer level, based on the different molecular weights uh, at the various pHs, and they were also adding some salt uh, in a very small amount. So they were able to kind of model their entanglement and they used diffometry was the preferred method um, for measuring um, in this system. So, so in summary, you know, we do do a lot of polymer structural characterization, very traditional analytical uh, chemistry to really understand our raw materials, but we also do a lot of other uh, measures to really understand our products, to understand interactions, to understand how that product is, is the mechanism of action of how that product is going to perform and how that polymer is delivering um, the consumer desired experience of our products. And so we're continuously looking for new methods and new measures um, uh, for characterizing polymers and their interactions. And um, just wanted to say thank you to my PNG team. I, I think uh, I saw Carrie was on online. She's very active with this Ivan group. I uh, wanted to say thank you to the PNG internal funding for supporting this work and uh, to the planning committee and to Ben and Lou for being part of this panel with me. So uh, that is my talk. Um, were there any questions that I could take? Um, any questions from the chat? Uh, I, I can kick us off, Jackie. I had um, a, a technical question um, that I hope isn't too gruesome. Um, so <laughs> one of the things that's measured by diffusion intrinsically is the T2 relaxation of a molecule because the molecule has to diffuse away and then we apply whatever bipolar gradient and then we can measure how far it went. So in terms of looking at blockiness, how much effort do you guys put into making sure that your diffusion curves are normalized against blockiness where you have perhaps, you know, uh, polystyrene blocks that are very rigid because you have some pie stacking along those arrow rings that's going to affect the apparent diffusion curve. Mm -hmm. I know at Dow, we run into this problem all, all the time. Um, and it takes me a lot of effort to explain to my colleagues what's going on. So I'm curious at PNG, do you guys run into these types of issues? You know, what's kind of your workflow um, for as much as you know, you're allowed to share certain, but you know, yeah. what, what are your thoughts around here? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, for most of the polymers that we've done diffusion studies on, we're talking about um, um, polymers that are, are, are not necessarily modified. So most of the PVOHs, right? Um, if and when we do do diffusion, we're talking about a very high degree of hydrolysis. And so we don't really run into the issue of blockiness, but now we're starting to get into more and more um, modified polysaccharides. 
And so that that is definitely an area where we're starting to, to get into more, starting to think about um, you know, how to appropriately measure these materials. Um, it's, it's, it's a journey and I'd love to talk to you more about what you're doing because I think we are gonna have to reapply that <laughs> to be honest. Yep. Yeah, this is polysaccharide space that those functional polysaccharides uh, is the space that I've been, I've been sacrificed to at, at Dow. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I'd, I'd love to keep in touch on this because there's a lot of um, just grueling work that went into concentrations and sample prep and the type of sequences to use. So um, I'll touch a little bit on that um, in, in some of the some of the, the slides in my talk. But no, I, I'd, I'd love to talk to you because I think there's um, certainly good work to be published. But just um, I've sacrificed my time and my blood, and my sweat, and almost all my tears on exactly this problem. So mm -hmm. um, I, I certainly don't want anyone reinventing the wheel here. But <laughs> Perfect, you know, great answers, thank you. See, I don't think I see anything from chat. Other questions from other people in the audience? Yeah, I can go ahead and speak up and ask the question in real time. I see one on chat, please go ahead. Hello, Jackie. Uh, very nice conversation, uh, presentation, and uh, I'm, I'm Agnieszka. Uh, so regarding diffusion coefficient, I wonder whether uh, you are using any convection compensated pulse sequences, because uh, my experience with diffusion uh, of polymers at uh, like a concentration below entanglement is that they are very often aff affected by convection, especially if you are working with solvents like chloroform, THF, which are very good solvent for my polymers. Uh, uh, and the kind of traditional approaches may sometimes not work, so it kind of gives you the uh, wrong diffusion coefficient. So what is your experience here? Yes, yes, very good question. Um, so we, we do have um, um, sequences where we, we are using the convection compensated systems, especially if we're measuring something like in chloroform. We also take the approach of like these shigimi tubes and whatnot to make sure that we don't have that kind of convection that goes through it. Um, the, one of the um, interesting things, it's, it's kind of like a um, love-hate relationship I think we have in the consumer goods industry is most of the materials that we're dealing with are aqueous based systems. So we, we rarely work with um, materials that are uh, primarily organic um, um, in terms of like uh, solubility. They don't, it, it's more aqueous based. And so like the polyvinyl alcohols, the polysaccharides, other materials that we use. Um, so we're usually trying to measure most of our diffusion uh, within a water-based system. And so for that reason, um, we do have to, to, to really keep an eye on our temperature, um, but it, it is very different from the world of like THF and chloroform um, diffusion. I'll, I'll add to, to Jackie's you. answer um, that depending on the rigidity of the polymer you're measuring, sometimes the, um, the, the compensated sequences, um, the, the blocks for the compensation are simply too long. Um, and so you you can just be competing against T2 problems, T2. especially if you have T2 in the in the order of tens of milliseconds. Those those temperature compensations or those um, those types of compensations just um, aren't accessible for diffusion. So a lot of time we just take the practice of exactly what Jackie is talking about using the sample limited tubes. So there's just really nowhere for that convection to go, um, as well as uh, directly controlling the variable temperature at the probe. So we'll set temperatures to like. 23 degrees Celsius, for example, and have that active control. Um, but at, at, usually, with a couple tricks, uh, we can we can avoid these problems. But I just wanted to throw out the that if you have very rigid polymers, sometimes those those convection compensation sequences are are just disfavorable because um, you'll you'll compensate for convection and just have no no signal at the end of your your T2 envelope. Some yeah, of the, just... uh, sorry. Uh, somebody uh, men mentioned to me that uh, it's probably instead of using convection compensation uh, compensating pulse sequences, it's uh, sometimes better to use the thick walls um, NMR tubes. Uh, but I don't. I have never kind of compare what is the outcome here. So, yeah, maybe I'll just jump in that we often use capillaries. So if you drop capillaries. Ah. if you drop a bunch of capillaries in there, usually we use like one millimeter capillaries, one, one and a half millimeter OD capillaries, um, you know, something like 
uh, five or it, depending on the tube size, right? Or the capillary size, you know, sort of like five or 10 capillaries in there um, will break up a lot of the convection paths. So, so that's another way to get around that. So there's the narrow tubes or the shigemi tubes, but you can also just take a regular tube and get some, get some capillaries. So unless you're looking for, obviously it's going to affect your shims a little bit, but unless you're looking for really, really narrow lines, it, it isn't really a major disruption. Thank you, very useful. Sure. All right, well, yeah. great, great questions. Um, why don't we go ahead and move to our next speaker? Lou, would you like to share your screen? All right, great. Um, so yeah, thanks very much to um, uh, the Ivan organizers for um, inviting me to speak. I think that's via Jackie. So Jackie kind of masterminded this, uh, this topic. And um, yeah, I'm always always excited to talk about um, polymers. And uh, so I, you know, in my abstract, I and Jackie brought up that I use the term intermediate state NMR. So I sort of came up with this, I don't know, 10 years ago or something, because really when we often as NMR people, uh, or not as NMR people, but get, people get trained to do NMR on small, mo small molecules, right? So fast tumbling molecules in solution or crystalline solids, which might be like powders, right? Where it's sort of nanocrystals, but you know, like the protein people, people talk about nanocrystallography. Um, you need to have ordering that's at least, you know, many molecules, tens or hundreds of molecules in order to get say solid state NMR sequences to work. Um, and that polymers very often, uh, as Dave pointed out in uh, talking about Jake Schaefer's work, um, Jake was a big good friend of mine and a, and a hero of mine as well. And that is he really spent a lot of time thinking about local ordering, uh, often in the absence of global ordering or crystalline type ordering. And that's, um, that's actually most of what we have around us and in our bodies is not crystalline, right? Um, and and uh, isn't necessarily low viscosity, fast tumbling liquids e either. So, um, so I, anyway, I started using this term, I don't know, a while ago, a dozen years ago, intermediate state, partly because most NMR uh, experiments or methodologies are based on either fast tumbling liquids or crystalline solids. And so uh, there's a very difficult in-between state, uh, intermediate state that's, you know, spans heavy polymer chains in solution. You know, if you're at 100,000 or a million molecular weight in solution, you start to get some solid state type interactions getting reintroduced in line widths. Um, and if you're at the other end, say we, we study polymer membranes, you often have um, you know, things that are confined in small spaces. So they're like liquid molecules or small molecules that are confined inside a solid, sometimes at nanometer dimensions. So, so that's kind of the space we like to play in. And uh, the, one of the you know, modern uh, slang terms I like to borrow is no fear. So we basically, you can, you can look at it and say, well, that's just a mess. I don't understand anything. Um, or you can just go ahead and just do the experiments and do your best to interpret a bunch of experiments that, that you can do. Um, all right, so I changed my title slightly to just, I decided because of the time, I would just talk about my cells today, but I'll just give you an overview of what, what the kinds of things we work on. Um, first thing I did like to do is acknowledge the people who did this work um, uh, mostly that's Shuli. Oh, can people see my pointer? Sorry, let me change that. Okay. So people see the pointer. Okay. So Shuli Lee, uh, who's um, been graduated for a couple of years, Bryce Kidd uh, and Shravanupala um, did, did pretty much all the work that I'm going to talk about today. And we've collaborated quite a bit with Megan Robertson at University of Houston and her student Tyler Cooksey, funded by NSF, uh, the stuff I'll talk about today. Um, so really where we like to work is non-covalent assemblies. So I'm kind of a physical chemist by training. Um, and I like to think about intermolecular interactions and how molecules can self-assemble based on collective intermolecular interactions, and then trying to use NMR to kind of understand self-assembly, transport, things like that. So mechanisms for self-assembly and transport of, mo of molecules, which could be tiny molecules like water or ions, or they could be large molecules have uh, large polymers. Um, 
So we study a range of things. I'm not going to read this whole list, um, but um, you know, one of the things that we're kind of known for is working on polymer membranes. Um, you know, things like nafion and uh, block copolymers and things like that. Electrolytes is another area. And I've done a lot of work with liquid crystals and charged polymers um, and nano confined transport. So those are all things that we've published on and, and I encourage people to ask me questions about those or take a look at our papers. Today, I'm really gonna talk about uh, just my cells, um, which is kind of a nice intermediate state where you have an assembly of molecules that's sort of tens of nanometers in size. Um, and it's gonna be composed in these cases of polymer chains around 10K molecular weight. And then you're gonna have some cargo, potentially some cargo inside, which could be a co-solvent or it could be a drug, other things like that. So how do we understand these things? Um, this is kind of a, a plug slide I use for NMR of materials. So when you try to do material science with NMR, the biggest problem with NMR is that everybody knows what it's good for. And that is determining small molecule structure or molecular structure. Uh, and right, as we know, that's just really the tip of the iceberg, right? That, that's what all these facilities often do. But of course, um, you can do lots of other things with NMR. So just with spectroscopy, you can get at things like molecular alignment, um, associations between molecules, dynamics of bond rotations, um, kinetics of reactions, all those kinds of things. Um, and then uh, we, we really, we do a lot of that. Uh, we also focus also on NMR diffusometry. And really a nice thing about that is that you can say that what, tell what the diffusion coefficient is, quantify that for ions, small molecules, large molecules, whatever's in your sample that's got a good nucleus um, without uh, too short of a T2, as we were talking about earlier. Um, and, uh, and then we occasionally have done some MRI as well if you wanna spatially resolve how these dynamics and transport things um, happen. So we can access all these different length scales and time scales with NMR. And that's obviously a far bigger space than, than most people ever access, um, but we, we like to play as broadly as we can. All right. So um, yeah, so today I'll tell you about polymeric, polymer-based micelles, uh, which um, show up in a lot of you know, things, you know, you could call our cells are sort of little vesicles and there are micelles all over our bodies um, and in lots of consumer products and, and all over the place, right? So, so how can we understand how these micelles move, what, how their components move um, and maybe how they phase separate or how the populations of things like micelles, the unimer chains and cargo molecules um, work. All right, so I'll, I'll briefly go through a couple, couple things. Well, so just a background about block copolymer micelles. Uh, you really have a lot of uh, chemical vers versatility. So the unimer here is, is a block copolymer where you have the blue uh, is say a hydrophilic uh, part and the red is a hydrophobic part. And you've got this in water, or some hydrophilic solvent. Um, you can reverse it, of course. And then you have a greasy uh, core, okay, um, that you could maybe put some uh, reactants into and do a reaction. You can put drug molecules in that in those and, and use those to carry carry the drugs to into your body. Anyway, so these are amphiphilic molecules. Um, typically, polymeric micelles have very low critical micelle concentrations. Um, I'll mention I'll mention that a little bit later. Um, sometimes you can make them functional uh, by you know changing pH. You can change the configuration of polymer chain, for example. So I talked about drug, drug carriers, nanoreactors, you can do right reactions inside these things um, and coatings. So just to, uh, to get into a little more detail, this is a system that we studied um, with Megan Robertson, uh, which is PCL and PEO uh, in, sort of, um, in the sort of uh, 10,000 molecular weight regime. Um, we call this single chain a unimer. Obviously, it's not going to be stretched out like this. It's going to have some random coil con conformation if it's by itself in a good solvent. Um, uh, you know, the PEO basically is hydrophilic, so that goes on the outside. It's low, it's low toxic, FDA approved. Um, the P PCL uh, is, is biodegradable. Okay, it's easy to do the chemistry of PEO. So Megan, Megan, Megan Robertson made a bunch of um, these different molecular weights and different different types of samples. Uh, again, you have this corona, which is the hydrophilic part, and the core, which is the hydrophobic part. 
I won't talk about this, but Megan's group, Megan's group did a bunch of uh, neutron scattering and rheology and light scattering and lots of other things to characterize these. And then we did uh, simultaneously, we did NMR experiments to characterize a lot of things. So what we did was basically a very simple pilot study is we took, we took this system in water and then we put THF, varying, varying amounts of THF, which is a more hydrophobic solvent, which should partition favorably into the core, although not entirely. And then look at what happens to the micelles as you add more THF. So this is just kind of a pilot study to understand what happens to a block copolymer micelle when you change a co-solvent. Um, I'll say a little bit about techniques. Probably most people have seen this, but right, this is just the pulse gradient stimulated echo sequence. I like to use the term diffusometry rather than pulse field gradient because lots of PFGs get used for all kinds of things over NMR and Sometimes reviewers say, oh, you know, you can't use just PFG. And also diffusometry is a nice parallel with spectroscopy because diffusometry is its own family of techniques uh, that's actually only just barely being explored now. So I think there's lots more things to discover and apply diffusometry to. So I like to use that term, um, you know, good nuclei that have long T2s, right? And the, and the, the difference between diffusometry and most spectroscopy is that you're applying a sequence that intentionally changes a signal amplitude, right? So it's not just like 1D where you're looking at relative amplitudes and integrating right here. You're doing integration as a function of this gradient strength and other parameters. Um, and then you plot this, oops, you integrate this and then do a plot and, and fit that to get the diffusion coefficient. Okay. Um, right, and dozy also I think is related. A lot of people just say dozy is a blanket term, but that's really a specific way of displaying the data essentially, right? It's a 2D experiment and is, is fairly specific. So again, I like to use diffusometry. So the great thing about uh, NMR diffusometry, obviously you quantify self-diffusion coefficients. If you have one, um, one diffusing species, uh, say in solution, then you're just gonna have in this linearized plot Right, here's all the NMR parameters, uh, gamma, gradient strength. Um, uh, well, I don't know how that turned into a sigma. Sorry, that should be a small delta. Um, uh, this is the gradient uh, pulse length and then the gradient pulse spacing. So that's all the NMR parameters. That's the log of the intensity, uh, normalized intensity. You're gonna get a straight line if you have one species. If you have two species, which could be two species in the same phase, or it could be one species that coexists in different phases of a material. Okay, so, so we have to know something else about the material or do some other experiments to sort of tell the difference between those, but, uh, but we can quantify these populations, assuming as we, as I think we talked about T2. So you gotta make sure the T2s are, are long enough so that your pulse sequence can be applied and not differentially weight this different species. So you have to be careful about that. But if you're careful about that and those T2s are long enough, then you can quantify these populations as well. Okay, and you can check that. You can check that with you know varying delta experiments and, and do other things to measure T2, right? For the different components of your sample. All right. Um, so basically we're gonna use this to probe these block copolymer uh, dynamics and partitioning. So this is, a, this is a plot of diffusion coefficient as a function of volume percent THF. So we're taking a binary mixture of water and THF with this, with this polymeric micelle uh, in it. Uh, and it, it turns out for this system, uh, these are the solvent diffusion coefficients up here, THF and water. And then we have two diffusion coefficients at low THF con con concentrations. And then at 60% THF, it goes to one. And essentially we can assign these to the fast one, the faster ones are the unimer, the free unimer in solution and the slow ones are the micelle, okay? And we can quantify, um, quantify, quantify the populations of those as well. So obviously if we're doing a two component fit, we're not gonna get this to 1% error. It's something like if, if you're doing a good experiment, it's something in the neighborhood of say 10% 10, 10 error of these populations uh, of the value of the populations so of 50% would be plus or minus five roughly um, if, if everything's working well. Uh, but basically you can quantify these populations of universal micelles. One surprising thing we saw with these block copolymer micelles is that there is not a clean um, uh, change that is this, the CMC, uh, you can do this with temperature or with composition actually, is that 
there's a more continuous variation of the free unimers than we would expect. And we've seen this for across a wide range of, of polymeric micelles now that this theory says that all of a sudden at, the, at a magic temperature or magic concentration, you, you start making micelles and you add more micelle material and, and the polymer, the micelle part uh, fraction gets bigger and the unimer part uh, chain doesn't change, but that doesn't seem to be the case for block copolymer micelles. So, um, you know, that's that's a, some serious consideration for the theorists, I guess, and just trying to understand why that is. But um, anyway, that's something we discovered along the way. We've got a few papers published on these things having to do with mapping this out as a function of concentration uh, and also temperature. And we made some phase diagrams and things like that with populations as well as um, humor and, and micelle fractions. Okay, um, Jackie, should I, what do you think? Another five minutes or am I getting towards, I think we can probably go a little more. Yeah, another five okay. minutes should okay. be good. Yeah, so great. Um, okay, so this is just a, a cartoon, right? So we basically have, uh, the other thing that's, that's also I didn't point out is that actually the, the radius of the, my cell also changes some as you change the con uh, composition. So as you change the solvent or as you change the temperature, the, the, the size of the core and the corona actually change as well. And you can do neutron scattering to get the, the sizes of those pieces. But of course we can get the hydrodynamic radius from Stokes-Einstein with diffusion measurements. So basically the micelles are large and they're coexistent with unimers at low THF percent. And then the micelles get a little smaller uh, and there's more unimers, and then they they dissipate into free unimers at above 60% THF. So um, the next thing is to you know we did we've done this in uh, in this paper is to do temperature dependence, uh, but also we'd like to understand something about cargo uptake. So so THF is kind of a we can tell you how much uh, in principle how much TF is in THF is in there, but it's in fast exchange. So how do you deal with that fast exchange that is in and out of from free solution to micelles? Um, so the next thing we did is we, we used uh, actually a very well-known uh, pleuronic polymer that's actually been commercially available for a cancer treatment as a drug delivery carrier with Taxol for, for a while. Um, and we tried using sort of more hydrophilic, uh, smaller drugs, and then, and then more hydrophobic, but also small, and then more hyd very hydrophobic and also large. So we basically loaded these into um, these pleuronic micelles. Um, um, here's, the, here's the paper on that. And then uh, wanted to understand what happened to the cargo. So if you, if you talk to most micelle drug delivery people, they'll tell you that the drug is inside and then it goes into the body and then it goes somewhere and delivers its cargo. Um, at least with this system, that is not the case. Or that is that the drugs, one thing you can tell right away is the drugs are in fast exchange. That is, they're not just sitting in the micelle, um, they're, they're in fast exchange with the free solution. So if you were to make this micelle injected in the body, that taxol is coming out into the bloodstream very quickly. So the micelle lets you get it into the body, possibly with lower dose, but it doesn't actually take it far in, into the body before it kick, gets kicked out of the, out of the micelles. Um, so that's sort of a... Anyway, so we, we formulated some drug-loaded micelles um, one issue is that uh, if you want to do NMR spectroscopy, you can't actually, you don't have any different peaks for the, for the drug in the micelle versus the drug in solution. The line widths are probably slightly different, but one, they're in fast exchange and, and they're, um, they're not resolvable. So, so diffusion helps us out there. Um, so basically how much drug is in the micelle versus in free solution and how does that change over time, for example. Um, so you'd like to know this to sort of you know, look at drug crossing into the cell membrane, assuming you could get the drug to stay in the micelle, uh, release rates, design of, design of formulations, all those things. So we basically set about quantifying this partitioning. Um, so I don't have a lot of time to go through this, but, um, but this is in our 2020 paper. Um, even if the drug is in fast exchange, you can do some experiments on model systems. That is, you can do the drug, the, um, diffusion of the micelle, which is the polymer chain diffusion coefficient, um, assuming there aren't very many free. And then you can get the drug in free solution. If you can dissolve enough and do a diffusion experiment, then you can get the drug in pure solution. And then you get a, 
diffusion of your drug in the average solution where the drug is partly in solution and partly in the micelles. And you can use also this equation constraint that you have a population equal to 100% or one for the drug in solution and the drug in the micelle um, to extract the population of the drug, or that is the, the two populations of the drug in the solution and the drug in the micelle. So we can quantify that um, quite readily. And uh, this is just an example. The endo, this endomethacin drug in water has this diffusion coefficient. In micelle solution, it has this coefficient. But the polymer, uh, polymer um, chain, the micelle diffusion coefficient, is slower than this. So the endomethacin is sampling two environments, and you're seeing the weighted average of those. And that gives you the partition uh, coefficients. Um, OK. Um, so this is basically the last slide. So essentially, um, what we were able to do is give you the drug percentage in the micelle versus out uh, versus the concentration of polymer chains. Um, and these are two different drugs. So for this more hydrophilic drug and smaller drug, you basically have less drug in the micelle. That drug percentage grows as you increase the polymer concentration, as you might expect. You have more polymers, more sort of more micelles, more volume inside the micelle to absorb drug. The endomethacin, um, which is the more hydrophobic drug, um, has a higher partition fraction of the drug in the micelles. Okay, so it partitions more strongly. Um, okay, I'll wrap it up there and, and hopefully we can have some discussion. So basically these block copolymer micelles can be cargo carriers. Um, these micelles and unimers coexist and we can quantify that by diffusometry. Uh, and we also can quantify the drug partitioning as um, uh, by diffusometry and as a function of things like size of the drug molecule, hydrophobicity, block copolymer we use, all those things. Um, I didn't talk about membranes and battery electrolytes. And so we do these things on all kinds of intermediate state, sort of uh, polymer based, usually polymer based systems where we have things, you know, lithium ions or water or other things uh, transporting inside media that are often designed for selective transport, like a battery electrolyte or a fuel cell membrane or reverse osmosis membrane. And we basically develop ways to understand diffusion and transport on multiple length scales and, and for different species and things like that. So, okay, thanks. Excellent, thanks, Lou. Um, we do have a question in, in the chat. Brian, if you'd like to come off mute and ask your question. Yeah, sure. So as Thinking about uh, when you add THF um, with that uh, block copolymer, mm -hmm. does it first swell before it shrinks? Um, oh, so you mean versus the free micelle? Yeah. What, well, okay. So basically, uh, for that for this particular system, sorry, for this particular system, um, it's very it's not really stable in pure water. Um, so it's possible if you could put it in pure water that it would be a little smaller, it, it should swell basically. Right. Um, yeah, so in fact, in fact, as you look here, the diffusion at 10% is higher than the diffusion at 30%. And in fact, as you put more THF in, the micelle does swell. Okay. And then there's sort of a plateau where it's not, it's about the same size and then it falls apart. So yeah, absolutely, it does it does swell. And actually, we use the diffusion coefficients of the solvent molecules to give you an idea of the local viscosity, like sort of calibrate what our what our hydrodynamic radii are, not just by the diffusion coefficient, but also the the relative diffusion coefficients of the of the solvents. Okay, that was the yep. second part of my question. Okay, great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Ooh, I have a question actually on this slide. So you, you hinted at, you know, how, especially on this graph of relative population, right? Where you have unimers and micelles, and then all of a sudden, bam, there's like a drop off. And now all you have are unimers. Mm -hmm. Whereas yep. like, if you compare that to the behavior of surfactants and micelles, right? It's very different. Um, do you have any hmm. theories behind why this drop off happens? Um, 
I mean, surfactants, if you were to mix solvents, I think at some point you're going to just dissolve the surfactants, right? That should be a yeah. pretty sharp, really sharp transition. Although it's sharp on one side, but not sharp on the other side, right? So it's really, mm -hmm. right. Um, you know, there's, there's 60 to 70, you know, as a, we didn't go to, you know, finer steps there, you know, we don't know exactly what that curve looks like. What right? the in between points are. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I don't know. Yeah, you, you might be right. I, I guess my sense is that if you take, took most surfactants and tried mixing solvents at some point, there would be, there might be some disturbance in the force, right? Some disturbance mm -hmm. of the, of, you know, you go from spheres to cylinders or something, and then you form like some kind of defective phase, and then it's, it sort of drops off a cliff and dissolves. So mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm not sure how general this is. And I haven't, I haven't done that kind of study with I guess my, uh, yeah, my understanding of, surf, of regular surfact, ionic surfactants, right, or small molecule surfactants is that they, they have similar sorts of transitions, but some are soft transitions and some mm -hmm. are, you know, harder, I guess, faster. Yeah, yeah, related to the head groups or even their molecular weight, right, so. Yeah, or yeah. which solvents you're mixing, right? Yep. Um, we only tried these because these are, you know, the experiments take a while and we sort of knew that THF was a good co-solvent and would go into the core and stuff, so yeah. So kind of along those lines, um, you, know, you have to make an assumption for the, the shape of the micelle when you're doing the diffusion fitting, um, or at least, mm -hmm. at least you can. Um, yep. Are you making the assumption that they stay relatively spherical, um, or is the assumption yep. that there's some oblacity change as you start to drive THF into these things? So I know a lot of the systems we look at, we'll start to see flattening of the micelles as you start to load sure. the substrates. And I'm curious in this system, is it worth even thinking about shape at that level of granularity? Um, and if you, if you guys mm -hmm. have, how do you kind of fit your head around, around this without, or without either without, without resorting to other techniques, or do you have to resort to other techniques like, you know, multi-angle light scattering to try to get a sense of yeah. how shape might be changing? I think if you really want to know, you'd probably have a tough time just using diff diffusometry unless, I mean, you know, we, Megan does neutron scattering and so they, they could fit all their profiles with spheres. And so we didn't, with this system and with the other system, they're pretty cleanly spheres in the regime that we're, all the regimes we were working in, uh, you know, low, very low concentration. Um, yeah. But as you go out, we did do some work on worm-like micelles and they would, they go worms to hex, you know, like a real hexagonal worm like a pneumatic worm to a hexagonal worm and then to a lamella or something like that. Yeah. So then, I mean, if you could, you can do diffusion anisotropy measurements, right? So we do a lot, we do, we used to do a lot of that. We just still do some um, on oriented materials, right? Worm like micelles often will feel the line or you can shear align them. Uh, if you can put a cell in your instrument, which we, we have a Rio NMR setup, um, you know, then, then you can do, you know, this way versus this way diffusion. And you can see, right, if it were planes, you'd see the difference between planes and rods, um, assuming that you can align them. And yeah, the oblong stuff, it, yeah, I don't, I haven't thought too much about it. I mean, there's like work from Jörg Carter's group where they have, you know, diffusion of anisotropic species, right? Or diffusing, diffusion in anisotropic media. And even though it's not globally aligned, there's signatures in the diffusion so I think there's more clues from the diffusion, certainly, that we can get at if you have a system like that, you know, there assuming, isn't. yeah, but yeah, but it, it, you'll still, you're probably going to have some uncertainty, right? You'll have to have some model in maybe there, another way to, yeah. The, the reason I asked is, uh, you know, we, we have these types of problems pretty consistently, and, and I think we're much lazier than you are. Instead of building a Rio NMR, we just... Um, yell at our, our GPC malls folks to try to make us a marcuing plot and get a sense of how that mm -hmm. how that form factor might be changing. What we've right. been playing with, um, for better or worse, almost certainly worse, is looking at that co-solvent, so in this case THF, and mm -hmm. seeing if you can measure a relative tortuosity of the, the mean path that's taking through the molecule. So you make some assumptions, it's, if it's a sphere, you know, a random path has some distance that goes into a sphere versus a completely mm -hmm. flat ellipsoid, what is the path it takes? And you can start to pull out some information this way. We have to bound ourselves pretty clearly by G GPC malls data, but mm. sometimes the NMR is a higher throughput just because we can 
we don't have solvents to worry about. There's not hysteresis. We can, you know, just throw things in auto samplers. Um, so we've started to play with that type of idea of, you know, can you can you guesstimate paths for these co-solvents and try to understand my cell structure? And it works exactly as well as you think it works, which is hmm. kind of. Um, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, it's, of, it's, it's like, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's sort of like you're built. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I, I forgot to mention at the beginning about this intermediate state NMR or, you know, even just like soft material science in general is basically... NMR people tend to think about things like, oh, I've got another NMR experiment um, and I can just throw more NMR experiments at it, right? And you know, what I often tell people is, is pick another axis that's not time or gradient strength or something, but is like material composition and do a bunch of experiments versus composition or temperature is an obvious one, right? A composition, you can do multiple composition, right? You probably often have five different things in there. You know, just do do scans along different comp. Those are axes in your NMR experiment, mm -hmm. right? And and they don't tell you everything, but if you do scans like that, then you get a lot more information. As and if you know how to interpret, if you under have some basis for model for the materials, it often helps you a lot more than just oh, let's try a you know another NMR experiment, let's try, you know, two-dimensional diffusion or diffusion, like we tried a lot of that stuff and honestly changing the composition and think something about the material gives you, I think, more information than, you know, you know, we just do T T1, T2 diffusion almost, and then 1D spectroscopy and we do a few other things, but, but just taking a system like this and scanning those composition axes has a huge, huge benefit. Um, I could not, I could not agree more. Um, we, we do a lot of the same types of things of, um, you know, a, a 1D NMR experiment doesn't have to solve anything and you can set up arrays in a variety of ways, including sample, yep. prep, including temperature. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Even processing. Right. So like exactly. try, start, you know, change the processing and temperature, kinetics, whatever, all that stuff, scan through it and then do your NMR experiments. Ultimately you'd like to do it all while the kinetics going on, but, but, you know, that's often harder, another level of difficulty, but but anyway, just since we got a hundred plus NMR people here, I, I just, it's, you know, the materials part, you have to learn more material science basically. But if you, if you know enough, you can scan those compositions and they really become dimensions in your NMR experiment rather than just, oh, I've got this one sample I want to understand. Take that sample and modulate it, right? Totally. I can see Jackie coming off mute to, to cut us off. So I, I think like, that means I, I, have, <laughs> I, I completely, have to present now. I completely agree with that conversation because I I am like one D proton. Let me look at the peak resolution, the shape. Let me look at the location because that can give you so much information just about what's going on. So yes, yes, Ben, it is your chance to do your presentation. Take us home. Appreciate it. So hopefully you guys can both hear me and you're seeing a uh, PowerPoint presentation. Um, it's a, it's always a hard act to follow uh, Professor Madsen there, um, but I'll, but I'll do my best. Um, someone stop me if you guys have questions or you know if the PowerPoint starts misbehaving. So hey everyone, uh, my name is Ben. I look like this. Um, as you can see by the red diamond on my screen, um, I, I work for Dow Chemical. I'm at the Collegeville location in Pennsylvania, so my winters are a little bit more mild than our folks out in, in Midland, Michigan. I've been at Dow since 2020. Um, so I've had a little bit of a wacky start um, with the pandemic about two months into my into my uh, my career here. For the next 15 or 20 minutes, I'm going to be talking about um, some non Fourier techniques in NMR and really the the practical uniqueness with respect to polymeric materials. Um, so uh, Lou saw this talk after after his talk at Panic. So um, you'll, you'll you'll have to excuse the redundancy for for him, but. Um, as I'm sure Jackie can appreciate, once something escapes the bureaucracy, you got to stick with that presentation. So it's hard to add more things. Um, but for the rest of you, um, this is really designed as, as more of a tutorial um, than any um, you know, real gory details. It's, it's meant to kind of show how do we think about non Fourier techniques, things like non uniform sampling, um, as they relate to, to our everyday materials. So I don't, I don't think I have to. Uh, belabor the, the richness or fullness of the non-uniform sampling literature to, to this audience. So I'll just leave this, this uh, snip from, from a Google search um, out as, as a reflection of that sentiment. 
but uh, a technique that I think gets tremendously less attention than non-uniform sampling um, is, is Hadamard spectroscopy. And before um, I, I, I talk more broadly about non-uniform sampling NMR, um, I'd, I'd like to introduce Hadamard um, NMR. Hadamard NMR is in spirit the same type of idea as non-uniform sampling. It's, it's designed to decrease experiment time and increase information density. And the reason I like to bring up Hadamard NMR within the broader discussion of compressed sensing in NMR is I think it's a better baseline when we're evaluating these non-uniform sampling techniques rather than a fully sampled spectra. So you may, you may see my PowerPoint kicking back and forth. I guess my slides are like shy when they're being presented. So hopefully that technicality washes out and just just bear with me through that. So let me introduce um, Hadamard spectroscopy. Um, there's, there's just a slide or two of, of more gory mathematics, but I have practical examples after that. So just bear with me through the more grueling details. Um, but I'm, I'm gonna start this off thinking about a, a really simple framework. Um, I'm a synthetic chemist by training. I'm, I'm not a physicist. I'm an absolute Neanderthal when it comes to linear algebra. So all my frameworks are to come from really simple, naive, standpoints. Um, and, and here's that here. When we think about conventional NMR, we're exciting the entire spectral window. Now, there are band selective flavors where we're just exciting one part of the spectrum, something that's you know, of interest. What Hadamard spectroscopy aims to do is to marry these two, these two ideas. Can we excite just the, the regions of interest and create these more bespoke envelopes for excitation? The value course of this is you're not wasting time on regions that just have noise. You're trying to spend all of your NMR Augusto only on, on peaks of interest. The way this is accomplished is using so-called Hadamard matrices. These are symmetric matrices. Formally, they're called Walsh matrices. Um, and they're really composed of just these ones and minus ones. How this is encoded into the NMR spectrometer is using negative and positive. Uh, pulse widths um, to, to, to give those, those ones and minus ones. Now, this is, this is the, the most mathematics we'll, we'll talk about for now. So um, we'll, we'll have practical examples in just a second. So again, I'm, I'm a synthetic chemist. So when I first read about the idea of Hadamard spectroscopy, I was, I, was, I was fully confused. So I wanted to set up kind of a colorful example so this could really cement my own understanding. And here's that, that mental exercise to explain what is special about Hadamard measurement. So in this mental exercise, I'm showing eight balls. I'd like to measure each of them eight times and the measurement might take five seconds. So think about we're gonna weigh each ball eight times for, for good statistics. And in this arbitrary mental exercise, that's gonna take five seconds per ball times eight balls times, um, we wanna run eight times takes 320 seconds. Again, just an arbitrary number in this mental exercise. So what we conventionally would do is we take a ball, we put it on a slide, uh, we, we measure it eight times, and then we do the same thing for the other seven balls. And the reason this takes a while is because we have to measure one ball at a time, eight times. What Hadamard spectroscopy or Hadamard measurements try to do is to apply this measurement trick. Here, we're going to measure every ball every time. So now we see this dramatic reduction in experiment time because we're not measuring one at a time anymore. And where those Hadamard matrices come into play is the location of these balls along the scale. Now, this reduction in experiment time isn't just at those powers of two. So the Hadamard matrices as a function of their symmetry are bound to powers of two, two, four, eight, 16, et cetera. So you see this dramatic increase in information density, not just at the powers of two, but at every possible number. And this is really important when we think about spectroscopy because this is gonna help drive our experiment time down across the board. So I promised some practical examples. Um, here, here are a few examples of, of some polysaccharides. Um, here's a spectra of dextran. This is a very common homoglucose polymer um, that's used in academia and in, in, in industry. This particular one was, was produced by this um, lactic acid bacteria who shares a name shockingly close to a Harry Potter spell. So dextrans are, are unique polysaccharides because they have a funny dynamic range. Most of the polymer is, is backbone residues and about three to 5% is, 
is branches. And so you have this interesting problem set up where 97% of the polymer is one thing and 3% of the polymer is another one. And I want to think, I want you guys to think about this in terms of surrogates of other problems you might see in your own research, whether that 3% is an impurity, whether that 3% is some dark state, or that 3% is something that's, you know, a, a, another piece of the formulation. These same ideas are going to apply. So here we're showing a, a Hadamard HMBC, proton carbon HMBC of, of dextran. It's spiked with TSP for both referencing and also just to demonstrate how wide a spectral window I'm getting here and how excellent the resolution is. So I'm getting subpart per million resolution across the entire spectral window, and this is only taking 65 minutes. If I ran a fully sampled spectra as you conventionally would, it would take almost 18 hours. This is a huge, huge drop in experiment time. Because Hadamard spectroscopy is not exciting the entire window, it's only exciting the peaks we want to, you start to see really cutesy type applications. So here I'm running two separate HMBCs and, and I'm overlaying them. One is excitation, just the polymer backbone, and one is excitation here at the branches. And you're not seeing any T1 artifacts, you're not seeing any dynamic range issues because you're only exciting what you want to. And so you get these really gorgeous overlays where you have beautifully selective spectroscopy. When I talk about this with my colleagues, I tell them Hadamard spectroscopy is a way to run NMR on just the impurity or just the polymer component you want to. You can even get cutesier than this. Um, so here what you're looking at is an in situ monitoring of an, an endodextrinase hydrolyzing dextran, so it's an enzymatic hydrolysis. For those following along at home, traditionally you do not run NMR kinetics in two dimensions because the kinetic rates just don't overlap. Traditional HMBC might take two hours, um, and you know, your half-life might be on the order of 30 minutes to an hour, or sometimes your half-lives are minutes, um, and so two hours is simply going to take too long. Here, every HMBC is only taking one minute, and so suddenly we're getting tremendous access to polymer microstructure and polymer behavior by accessing kinetic rates that would traditionally be inaccessible by conventional spectroscopy. And I'll sit on this slide just for a second longer because I think some of my colleagues from my postdoc lab are here. Um, this is relevant for polymers. This is also relevant for small molecules. For those of you looking at organometallic catalysis, you can run HMBCs, nosies, toxies, really any two-dimensional experiment on a minute to, to two-minute time scale and pull out extra signals that may just simply be included in one dimension. So I do want to highlight that this can be a really useful kinetic tool. So for the sake of time, I don't want to, I don't want to keep belaboring these points. Um, I, I, think, I think it's well shown that Hadamard spectroscopy is going to be great for experiment time. Um, it's going to be a dramatic increase in, in information density. I'll point out if you're a Bruker user um, and top spin three and a half or higher, um, super easy to deploy. I worked out a lot of the coding bugaboo, so feel free to reach out. Um, this is something you can absolutely do on, on your home instrument. Now, I had an NMR mentor in, in, in my younger years. Um, he used to say there's, there's nothing free in NMR. So I just spent the last couple slides availing us of the power of Hadamard spectroscopy, what's the disadvantages? So one of the key disadvantages is we're mathematically bound to powers of two. So a, a good kind of rule of thumb is you have less than 32 peaks, Hadamard spectroscopy can be really valuable, but at 33 peaks, you go to 64, at 65 peaks, you go to, to 128 slices. And so the, you get into a regime where, you know, a 50% non-uniform sampled um, spectra may be, may be more valuable. You do require a priori knowledge of peak positions and whatever your indirect dimension is. And in our industrial workflow, we always have um, a, a carbon on hand or, or um, a phosphorus on hand. Um, and so this doesn't slow us down too much, but you do need to know where peak positions actually are to, to build that excitation window. And finally, if you have really congested spectral windows, it can be hard to get selective excitation. We can play some tricks with Stoxy here to help enrich peaks and, and kind of pull um, pull out some deconvolution with statistical techniques, but congested spectral regions are definitely really, really challenging here. Okay, so the, the reason I wanted to talk about how to mark spectroscopy is again, I just want us to have a more honest conversation where we're considering these non forter techniques in general. When we talk about non-uniform sampling, I think how to mark spectroscopy is a much fairer baseline than talking back to, um, to, to fully sampled spectra. So I'm gonna give a criminally brief introduction to non-uniform sampling. I'm going to point out these, these two webinars um, given about a year ago by Frank DeLaglio. He's at NIST. These are absolute master classes in non-uniform sampling and spectroscopy in general. Please go watch them. They're on YouTube. Um, 
This will not be a masterclass. This will be just about a minute or two, again, criminally brief. So in, in one dimension, um, our, our spectral resolution and the experiment time are inexorably linked. If we want a certain spectral resolution, we have to wait for the entire free induction decay to get to that point. And that's just the schematic you're seeing here. And we have to sample that FID according to Nyquist's theorem. We all know this so we don't get involved with any, any, any funny aliasing problems. Now in two dimensions, our spectral resolution is really just set up by the endpoint. And we can sample in between as we need. So now this idea of spectral resolution experiment time is unlinked. Okay, and that's where non-uniform sampling becomes really accessible because instead of taking you know, the, the 64 slices you might normally take, you can take 32 or 16 and really start to decrease your experiment time. Now I wanna just pause and talk about a, a couple polymer specific points with non-uniform sampling. It's been reasonably shown in the literature that you need about five to 10, uh, five to 10 slices, five to 10 points as the maximum number of points and maximum of peaks in, in any column. The reason that's really relevant to polymers is polymers often have more peaks than you'd expect from group theory. So polymers may have more points as a, as a function of uh, associative effects, uh, of blockiness, of nearest neighbor effects, of uh, apportionment uh, across chains. So a polymer, you may have more peaks than you expect, which means you kind of want to build in that wiggle room when you're thinking about what level of sparsity am I using. And, and I'll mention that we talk about sparsity, non-uniform sampling, sparsity is uh, the percentage of a fully sampled spectra. We don't really care about sparsity. What we care about is total amount of points. Because if I have a million slice spectrum and I'm taking a 1% sparsity, I'll still have a beautiful spectrum. So we always want to kind of recalibrate ourselves to total number of points against how many peaks are we really expecting. Now, for the, for the, for the sake of time, um, I'm, I'm not going to talk too much about mathematical reconstruction of non-uniform sampled spectra. What I'll mention is the Fourier transform and undersampled NMR spectra is going to be a convolution of both the FID as well as the actual sampling schedule or what's called the, the point spread function. There is a tremendous amount of work used to improve the mathematics of these reconstructions so we can be as, as, as high a fidelity as possible back to that fully sampled spectra. Here's just a quick snapshot from the literature. You can get a sense of how many people are involved with this type of mathematics to use as sparse undersampled spectra as possible and still get something that's, um, that's uh, highly faithful to the original spectra. And, and the key takeaway for non-uniform sampling is it's really about balancing spectral quality and experiment time. And, and spectroscopists, I think, can appreciate that you often have spectral quality you can give up at, at the benefit of, of reducing your experiment time. When, when I started learning about non-uniform sampling more seriously, the question that I had was more on the other, other side of the coin, which is how do non-uniform sampling schedules affect the ultimate quality of the non-uniform sample spectra? Traditionally, this hasn't been the focus. A lot of non-uniform sampling came out of small molecule pharmacore work. And here, derivatizing pharmacores is gonna dramatically affect um, a lot of that molecular topology. So if you think about an indole being methylated, um, that methylation is going to change symmetry, it's going to change relaxometry, and that schedule that we had for the uh, parent molecule may be irrelevant for the small molecule, or for the, for the daughter product. Here in industrial portfolios, we're kind of in this niche workflow. We have uh, sets of materials that are fairly consistent. A lot of our polymers are pretty gooey ensembles. Is, is this workflow somewhere where the brittleness we expect with small molecules in terms of non-uniform sampling schedules will not be relevant for polymers and really can't have optimized schedules for kind of broad buckets of polymers. And that was the question that I went into as I started to research this idea. And of course, I'm not the first person to think about optimizing non-uniform sampling schedules. Here's an, an older example from Jeff Hawk's group from, from 93. Had a courtesy, I won't, I won't say when I was born, but in order, an older example nonetheless. And, and here they're using um, J modulation matching to try to get better and better schedules. And here's a more recent example from Phil Sidebottom's lab where they're using a remoteness factor to identify um, better non-uniform sampling. The remoteness factor is just an algebraic trick. But overall, the idea of using optimized schedules is still an outstanding question in NMR. And a lot of the reason is that applying this to polymers has just not been the general academic workflow. 
So are there, are there purpose driven workflows where, again, these buckets of materials in industrial workforce make sense to have optimized NUS schedules? I have a, I have a couple um, just quick motivations I think you guys will, will like. Um, what you're looking at is a proton carbon HMBC of just glucose. Um, we have a fully sampled schedule or fully sampled spectra here at the top left, and then a couple of different NUS schedules at 20% sparsity. Here's a Wagner Lab Poisson Gap. Here's a random um, sample from just Bruker, and here's an exponential weighted sample. And what you see is all of these spectra look essentially identical. And that should make a little bit of sense because when we think about our signal envelope, it's not decaying too much as a small molecule. And so how precisely we sa sample that, that envelope sh shouldn't have a large difference. But if we go from glucose to polyglucose, so we go back to that dextrin material, now we see large differences between these schedules. So if we look at, for example, a random schedule versus this Poisson gap schedule, we're seeing clear differences in these spectra. And so here's a situation where the, the actual NUS schedule is having a dramatic effect over both the, 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 the faithfulness of the spectra as, as well as its quality. So when I first approached this problem, I had a very naive idea, which is why don't we just check all of the possibilities of the schedules and I'll choose the best. And if you're following along, you should be laughing because this is a tremendously silly idea. The combinatorics are just grossly not in your favor. This is 10 to the 37. So even if you've got a supercomputer, you're still looking at perhaps months or even years to get through all the possibilities. So I, I chose a, a more judicious approach, which is let me look at some of the possibilities. And what I'm gonna do and, and show here is uh, I'm going to take 128 slices. I'm going to pull one out. I'm going to reconstruct the spectra and look at the effect of that slice I pulled out. By doing this, I can generate heat maps where I can say how much does each slice along a traditional schedule have an effect on the quality of the spectrum. And what you see here are these pseudo exponential functions. So red here is a highly impactful slice and yellow is less impactful. And so you're probably seeing a function of, of T2 matching here. You can fit these, um, these heat maps to the, the top n percent of points using a polynomial function um, and, and then compare to a fully sampled spectra. So here's that fully sampled dextran um, and here's that optimized spectra. And here we're starting to see better and better faithful quality. And remember at 20%, this is five times as fast as that original spectra. We can do this across a, a wide variety of materials. I'm actually using the same schedule for this uh, polymethyl methacrylate as well as this HEMA molecule, just to show that polymers may be less brittle in terms of having these optimized schedules. And you really can have um, one type of schedule for broad buckets of materials. You can do a little bit of quantitation here. So um, here I'm using a Tanamoto distance. Um, it's what it sounds like. One is 100% is the same. Um, anything else is a little lower. And here I'm comparing different NUS schedules to understand how close are we to that original, um, that, that, that original fully sampled spectra. And what we see across the board, a variety of polysaccharides, a variety of, of different um, buckets of materials is this optimization approach, the super simple generating heat maps, just taking kind of one slice at a time, very naive approach is consistently outperforming other types of schedules. And so I think this is a nice proof of principle that there are one workflows where this makes sense to spend the time to optimize your non-uniform sampling schedules. Um, and two, that polymers don't appear to be as brittle as small molecules. And there really are classes of materials that are broad enough that this makes sense. And the last, the last point I'll, I'll make here is I, I brought up Hadamard excitation or Hadamard spectroscopy to serve as, as what I thought was a fair baseline for, for non-uniform sampling or non-Fourier techniques in general. And here what you see is often the experiment time uh, for a Hadamard um, excitation spectra would be faster, or at least comparable to the non-uniform sample spectra. So you're always going to kind of balance spectral quality um, and experiment time. But here, you know, our, we're faster certainly than a fully sampled spectra with both of these, but Hadamard spectroscopy is really the fastest technique. And across industry, we're always trying to run as fast as possible, have the highest possible information density to gather as much information as quickly as possible. And so having really fair baselines for experiment time, I, I think is, is, is a more genuine comparison. This is why I'm always trying to have this worm in everyone's ear of Hadamard excitation, I think is a better baseline than fully sampled spectra. So 
I, I realized this was this was you know a, a fast kind of tour de force of, of a variety of non-four-year techniques. And what I want to show is is really two things. One, these are very easy to implement. A lot of what I'm showing is just two or three button presses. But importantly, industrial workflows are, are a specific niche where having these type of non-uniform sampled optimized schedules seems to be really relevant. For those of you working in polymers, I'd suggest you think about this a little bit. If you're not using non-uniform sampling, you certainly should be. Um, there's a little bit of extra wiggles, whether it's relaxometry or blockiness or association that plays a role here. But almost always, you can reduce your experiment time by 50% simply by using 50% non-uniform sampling. And I'll finish up by just giving um, a shout out to, to my colleagues in core research here in analytical sciences at Dow, um, specifically uh, Jim D. Philippus and, and Owen Young. Um, thank you, Jackie, and to the, the broader panic um, organizing committee for bringing me on. It's, it's, it's always fun to talk about spectroscopy. And um, thank you to the audience for bearing with me through the talk. And I'd love to take questions um, when you guys have them. Thank you so much. Excellent. Excellent talk, Ben. Thank you. All right. Do we have any questions from the audience? Don't be I shy. Have a question, ben. Ben. Um, <laughs> this this approach is 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 really great. Um, I could see fitting this into some of my workflow. Um, I was just wondering what other nuclei besides carbon proton have you attempted this on? It's it's a really good question. Um, so. We'll talk about this theoretically. Theoretically, it works with anything because it's an affirmatics approach. It's agnostic to what you're looking at. This technique is really coming more broadly from the field of compressed sensing, um, which is just how do we get information as quickly as possible? So if you think about like astronomy, a quasar explodes every million years. Telescopes are always pointed at the sky. You can't miss the quasar because you can't tell, hey, try it again. Um, so those techniques are are agnostic to NMR, to, to telescopes, mm -hmm. to whatever measurement tool. That being said, in practice, I find proton carbon works gorgeously, um, fluorine works gorgeously. I start to see funny um, CSA effects and, T, and T2 effects with nitrogen, um, where the real axometry of the nitrogen at different parts of the polymer plays a role in how you're sampling, because you're, not, you're simply not getting enough information. There, what I've started to do is, is leverage the artifacts you're getting from non-uniform sampling to gain information about those nitrogens. So if you example, if you have a nitrogen that's pointed at part of a micelle versus outside a micelle, your non-uniform sampling schedule is going to reflect that. Sometimes reflects it in strange ways, um, but there's always tractable information there. So that's, a, I think, a key part of, of all of two-dimensional spectroscopy is to keep in mind that when you have these really complex polymer ensembles, all of all these different roles are gonna are gonna play a play play a place. So it's you know uh, blockiness and and uh, the domain size and associative and interactions and at least practically in my work, I see nitrogen is very sensitive to that. We expect that you know we has it has that quadrupolar um, that, that quadrupolar feature. Um, that doesn't mean it can't be done. It just means like all things in NMR. Um, you try to you try to guesstimate, you know, what 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 kind of fudge factor, what kind of um, response do I have to worry about? And so, um, when I, when I do this type of work with nitrogen, I'm always looking for artifacts back and forth. Thankfully, we have a lot of similar materials, so I'll have a database of fully sampled spectra, and then I can do these types of explorations with with newer things. Excellent. And I see in the chat, Ben Reed has a question. Ben, do you want to? Come off mute. Ask your question. Ah, oh, there we go. Uh, so, yeah. So I oftentimes do, uh, as my message said, uh, I'm given a sample of you know a polymer. They want to know what the impurities are, for example, or maybe just to construct the composition of the polymer itself. And uh, it, it's quite a mixture. Um, and is there advice, I guess, for if I want to say do 2D with NUS for something where it, it, it'd be basically a completely naive approach to it? You know, I, I have no idea what is in it. Uh, it might have lots of minor peaks that I actually care about. Um, and, I, and they want compositional analysis, for example. Yeah, I, I, I love this question because we come across this all the time. 
Um, it's essentially a dynamic range issue of, you know, it could be a formulation or an impurity, but um, broadly what I'd say is it depends a lot on what the impurity profile is. So if you have 10 ppm of an impurity, um, it's not not an uniform sampling problem anymore. It's just an NMR sensitivity issue. Um, where non-uniform sampling can play a role is if you can, I would say if you can see your impurities after 16 scans, they're probably at a high enough concentration that the artifacts that non-uniform sampling will introduce are probably not going to overwhelm those impurities. I'm saying probably on purpose because in practice, it's hard to say. Um, generally speaking, especially for small molecule impurities where they're, they're well behaved, a 50% NUS schedule should have plenty of points um, that you shouldn't see dramatic artifacts with, with your, your small molecules. Um, NUS is really relevant for two-dimensional spectroscopy. While you can certainly non-linearly sample your, your, your direct dimension, whether it's proton or carbon, this is really for multi-dimensional spectroscopy. But um, I'd certainly say if you have 32 points, um, even 16 points for some small molecules, that's going to be that five to 10 times um, amount you need to, to get an ad adequate reconstruction. So my recommendation is um, try a fully sampled spectra and then try one at 50%. And just that'll help you kind of get that level setting in your head of how valuable is this in, in your own workflow. And we can certainly talk offline about um, different reconstruction techniques and how that can move artifacts and non-uniform sampling doesn't necessarily have for your noise. So there, there are some fitting tricks you can use to clearly identify artifacts from true cross peaks. Thanks. No problem, great question. I have a, uh, this is Krish. I have a question. Yeah. Okay, um, um, one of the, I, we found one of the critical um, requirement for hard mod, as you actually mentioned, um, is knowing the frequency positions, right? I mean, you need to know where you are encoding your your RMR matrix. So, uh, is there more work done in terms of uh, generating some kind of a hybrid approach, essentially using regions as RMR encoded regions, and then within that region, uh, do uh, conventional um, time domain encoding, and and we we did play around with this about 20 years ago and, and few papers we published, but then, uh, and then now non-uniform sampling is coming into picture. So there is, there's a potential opportunity to generate hybrid approach uh, without needing to know exactly where your positions are, frequency positions are, rather think in terms of band. Um, yeah, so it's you're gonna you're gonna steal my my next publication in JMR, Krish. Um, such a, such a shame. Um, so we looked at exactly this, um, and it's it's something that we're trying to um, kick kick outside the DAO bureaucracy. But um, yeah, I I really like this idea of had a, of of a kind of hybrid approach. And what we had tried looking at is essentially stochastic excitation, um, where you take a band selective spectra, so you're fully exciting 100 to 120 or 100 to 105. Um, and using that where you see some kind of blip in your FID to say this is identifying um, peaks for a Hadamard excitation. Um, so it's, it's a sort of peak finding um, algorithm. This works in situations reasonably well um, where we know what the impurities will be because we know what the process is, we've seen it before. In situations where um, we get literally like a piece of pipe and somebody's like, I don't know why it's not working. Um, it's very hard to use this type of approach because as I'm sure you could appreciate, um, the difference between different small molecules and even oligomeric impurities can be very tight. And trying to get peak positions through a, 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 what we'll say a non-human approach, an unsupervised approach is really challenging. You know, think about just glycol structures um, and trying to find the carbon shifts this way. And you might 61 to 62 might be your resolution there. Um, so we have we have a couple cases where um, I think this type of um, unsupervised excitation can can be really helpful. I'm um, exactly what you're thinking about these little subsections of the spectrum and you build them up. Um, but in true uh, decomposition campaigns um, or true deformulation campaigns where we have no idea what we're looking at, 
um, conventional spectroscopy tends to be um, the, the way to go. And, in, and we're always trying to add machine learning and neural nets and these kind of fancier informatics tools. But um, I, I race the, the more cynical um, elder, elder NMR people in my, in, in my, in my fields. And um, I, can, I can say confidently that I have yet to find informatics technique um, that outcompetes um, just a senior spectroscopist in these true deformulation techniques. So I think um, non-uniform sampling had a MART spectroscopy really helpful, um, but you, know, you always have to use um, what will solve the problem the fastest as the baseline. Thank you. I I didn't mean it as a reconstruction part of it. I am more uh, uh, thinking in terms of uh, using multiple bands completely blind without knowing exactly where the peaks are, just essentially say 0 to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, 30 to 40 bands, and encode them in a Hadamard fashion. Yep. Then so, between that, yep, I, 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 I done that. Yep. 20, use conventional non-uniform sampling, whatever, and then essentially decompose it back. Uh, we did publish papers back in nine, uh, 2000, early 2000. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the acronym for that, I don't know how to expand the acronym anymore. These days, once you generate an acronym, you forget what it stands for. Uh, there are papers on, uh, we called it IMPRESS, uh, I think improved resolution, now I don't remember, uh, but back in the 2000, uh, early 2000, there are HSTCs, SMDCs, band selective experiments we did, but that, for some reason, that never picked up for no particular reason. Um, that's, I'm just curious as to why, if there is anybody picked up on that. I have picked up on that, and if you pay attention to JMR, I think you'll like our next publication because okay. we have read your papers and we love them, um, and uh, have been trying to apply that to, to polymers more generally. I can see Pooh putting his hand up, up and down, and it looks like he's getting desperate. So I, I want to give him a chance to, to, to ask. I guess. Question. So yeah, I also I remember sort of when all the Hadamard and earlier things came out, that was like late 90s or something like that, or right around 2000. And, you know, I think I basically one comment, which is I love what you did in the beginning of your talk where you had the, the kinetics following the kinetics. To me, in my opinion, your, anything you do, non-uniform Hadamard, whatever is biasing, the Fourier transform is unbiased, right? As long as your sampling bandwidth is big enough, your pulses are short enough and powerful enough, you get everything, right? If you set up your experiment right. And then basically you have all the data. So that, to me, that's what you do first is to know where the things are. But if you want to follow something, that's very slow. And that, I mean, I love that point because that's like, that's, there are a lot of times you want to follow kinetics or you want to look at changes or you want to you know where all the peaks are, but you've done a different process and now you have different relative peak sizes or something. And that, to me, that's really the beauty of the, the Hadamard, Hadamard part. And, and the non-uniform, I, I, I like the way you, you know, talked about the artifacts. You know, at a factor of two, you're gonna, artifacts are gonna be very small, right? But you need to have a sense of that um, if you're gonna look for impurities and stuff and figuring out where these, you know, ghost peaks or shoulders are gonna come from, things like that. So that, that was nice. I guess, you know, one, anyway, maybe you can comment on this, but I was thinking sometimes you have a broad peak and then a bunch of narrow peaks, right? You're looking at basically polymers in solution where they're in good solution, good solvent, and the peaks are not very broad. So like, that's kind of an ideal case. And that, you know, once you start having broader peaks or overlapping broader peaks or broad peaks with narrow peaks on top of them, then, you know, does it, does it help you to do this or what, what, you know, are the, the artifacts would seem to be worse or sort of less predictable or at least not quantifiable, I guess, if you do that, maybe you could comment on that. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if you and Chris are, are trying to be co-authors on these papers I'm publishing, but at this point, <laughs> I think you gotta be. So um, I was really curious about this exact idea because we have really rigid polymers um, whose identity I can't talk about um, with small molecule impurities whose identity I can't talk about. Um, but big difference in peak width, big difference in T2. Um, and so I did a, a, a fairly rigorous study looking at non-uniform sampling schedule where you're changing the density toward the end 
of your mm -hmm. sampling envelope. So things that should favor small molecules. Mm -hmm. And what you see is you can programmatically enhance the, the, the cross peak of small molecules by, by suppressing the polymer peaks. And so what you get is the pseudo T2 T2 fil like filter on the top of your HMBC, yeah. HSQ, et cetera. And there's just small molecule enhanced um, spectra. We think the proof of value case is that instead of a T2 filter that would completely knock out polymer peaks, mm -hmm. you essentially have something that's a little bit more programmatic. You don't have to worry about phasing artifacts. Um, and so you get mm -hmm. a little bit of polymer information, a ton of small molecule information. So um, I've been trying to leverage exactly this effect where you have polymer peaks that are partially including small molecules in one dimension, partially including them in two dimensions, and using the NUS schedule judiciously to to purposely increase the small molecule for identification. Quantitation, as you know, is, is always a little funky in NMR, especially when you're talking two dimensions, especially when you talk about non uniform mm -hmm. sampling. So in this context, it's really about identification for us and saying, yep. hey, you're within the bucket of a lot, a little, or don't send this to the EHS. Great. Nice, thank you. That's no great. problem. I saw a couple um, questions in the chat. Um, if anyone wants to come off, uh, off mute, I think Marta might have won the the question lottery, um, but anyone come off mute and we'll keep we'll keep on chatting. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, beautifully. Hi. So um, I'm working with this um, very extravagant polymer because um, I have multiple issues. So the first one, it's soluble in water, but if you increase too much the the concentration, it will form a gel. So then you wouldn't have a very good. Resolution. So I'm going to keep an eye on this Hadamar because in my institution, I'm charged by hours. So I think it's very interesting to decrease the time and also to make a more efficient design experiment. So the problem is so far, I've been modifying the backbone with different molecules. And it was just not modifying, not creating an amphiphilic compound until now what I'm trying to work with these new families to create a micelles. And the problem is, well, I will attach a aliphatic, very long aliphatic chain. And I put them in deuterium oxide because it's probably one of the few solvents where they're soluble. And then when I try to analyze the data, I only do patterns because it's not worth to, to do more than that. I came across very complicated, very inconsistent results. So I don't know if it's because while I'm doing the reaction, a little bit of my starting material will be entrapped inside, first one. Second one, because they're creating the micelles and they're inside, I can't see the interaction with the solvent. Second problem, both, none. Can someone share a little bit of, a, of his expertise or any suggestions? Because it's absolutely driving me crazy. I can talk can about we... it from a synthetic standpoint, but I'll let Lou and, and Jackie talk about it from a spectroscopy thing, because we, we run into these problems all the time, but I'll, I'll step back for a second. So I'm not alone. No, yeah, no, I don't think so. Yeah, so I mean, when you say inconsistent results, does that mean you just make the same thing and then, or you think you've made the same thing and then you get different spectra or? No, or that I will more, or get, you get Do you get like a really broad line for the, for the aliphatic part or? So in this uh, few, I did a very, a complex matrix is modifying little parameters in during the synthesis and then I will analyze on the NMR and okay. sometimes so the easiest way I found to 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 know the degree of substitution will be or integrating the whole part that I know they should fold the 13 mm -hmm. products and just take the long piece and making the integration which is not very accurate but I want to get an idea we're talking about a 20 milligrams per experiment. So it's just a little bit to get an idea. And then the other option is taking the very last peak, which is supposed to be the final ending of the aliphatic mm -hmm. molecule. They aren't matching most of the time. There are consistent differences between them. So that's what I'm saying. They're inconsistent. And also sometimes the degree of substitution will be weird, like um, more than what the molecule can accommodate. If you know what I'm getting. <laughs> Right, so you, you might have precursor molecules that are still in solution, I guess, is one thing, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah so that, well, I mean, sorry to interrupt. So basically, I'm attaching to so this, the sugars, there are two sugars, and there's one primary alcohol well, where the reaction should be happening. But I notice, and I spot in literature, that that's not 
always the case, like all the alcohols will react too. So it could be that they are, it's, it's attacking other alcohols, mm -hmm. maybe. So that will explain what I'm over 100% degree of substitution because they observe the same um, kind of behavior with other, with a similar um, starting material and other molecules. But it doesn't explain the inconsistencies when I'm trying to integrate the, the long piece, the long shift of the 13 carb, 13 nitrogen uh, products, for example, and just the last three. Mm. Yeah, it could be the precursor precursors, I guess. I mean, that's something you're not going to be able to tell by 1D, but it's something like diffusion. If you could measure diffusion coefficients, the, the short chains are going to be have a very different diffusion coefficients than the bound chains to the that are going to be in the micelle. Um, so that's one way. If there's a way to do a diffusion experiment, I don't know, Jackie. Maybe you want to comment. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we routinely look at the degree of substitution. We have some people in house that that do modifications, and so that's always the question: is you know, is there starting material, and is that influencing the degree of substitution because the uh, degradation uh, results are inconsistent. Um, and so one of the, the techniques we routinely employ is what Lou said, is we do diffusion and we try to see the separation of the small molecules from the polymer structure. We've done CPMG filtering experiments so that we just look at all of the, the small molecules. You know, we've mm -hmm. played around with craft that Krish has uh, developed to look at the differences between big um, uh, peaks versus the small molecule peaks. So there's there's quite a, an array to, to look at. And then the other thing is if you are forming micelles, look at it in a very dilute solution, right? Break up all those aggregates, try to, try to look at it in its most simplest form and try to see um, if you can actually determine the difference, especially like with diffusion of the small versus the large, larger molecules that are there. There is also so, something tricky. So this aliphatic long chain, there will be one double bond in the middle. And mm -hmm. I should see the peak around five, five, six. Mm -hmm. I can't see it. So did, did it react right now? Do you no, have no, some no, other no, reactions it should, it should, going on? No, no, no. It shouldn't be reacting because the other molecule I was saying, it, it, mm -hmm. that's what I, I choose this molecule because the other modification I was attaching mm -hmm. a double bond and it would be so easy so easy to spot even if there was a starting material they will have completely different shifts but in this case I will have all the peaks in the between 1.5 and, and 3 mm -hmm. of the long chain but the double bond they are invisible. So I thought, oh, maybe it's because they're inside of the micelle and they're not interacting with the solvent. So that's why I can't see it. But yeah, it's not so much, right. Yeah, it's it's basically, it could be that it's just rigid enough that the T2 is long is short, okay. right? So, and, so basically in NMR, there's no such, <laughs> signals never go away. They just broaden or narrow. They can get okay. narrower or broader, but basically the, mm -hmm. well, as long as it's in the NMR coil, there's there's there should be detectable signal there it's just how broad it is so you it could be that the double bond stuff is just broadened into the baseline if you took enough scans right for you might it's and it shouldn't be shifted even if it's in the micelle it shouldn't be shifted drastically i mean it might be shifted by half a ppm or one ppm at the outside but if it's if it's still in solution and hasn't reacted then it should be there somewhere in the spectrum. It just may be broad enough so that it looks like baseline. And if you expand and sort of take a lot of scans, you might still see a broad peak there. Okay, because another option I was considering, but the problem, again, I'm, my funds are very limited and I already run very long experiments because if I go above 1%, 1%, it turns into a gel. So, oh. but with this Hadamard, maybe I can do something specific just for those peaks while decreasing the time and improving deficiency because the other option I was considering it's to maybe uh, work under the CMC. The other mm -hmm. thing you might consider is temperature as another vector, right? Mm -hmm. So routinely yeah. materials that gel, right, even at higher concentrations, we routinely up the temperature of the probe and you can get um, 
uh, it, you can get more solubilization, you can break up interactions, you can actually see the polymer itself. So you might be able to reveal that double bond at maybe a slightly elevated and, temperature. And lines will narrow, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. the, Lou, Lou stole my point, which is sometimes going to lower concentrations um, will actually make the, the, the spectra easier to see um, because you'll go from these broad macromolecular assemblies to things that are, are um, easier to see in solution. Um, so going from 1% to half percent or 0.1% can actually improve your signal to noise um, because you don't have such broad resonances. Um, the oh, other recommendation- That might be good. Oh, go ahead, Ben. Oh, I'm saying the other recommendation is if the system is, um, is favorable, um, small amounts of sodium hydroxide will help to um, drive water into the micelle. Um, this can be tremendously helpful for increasing the, um, the, the amount, of, amount of gel that you'll end up seeing. So instead of having a 1% gel, um, you'll have a 5% gel. And that can make a big difference in, in improving signal to noise, which, um, you know, NMR, NMR integrations are going to be kind of funky um, if you have low signal to noise, because um, those Ryman integrations are going to be ugly against, against the baseline. Um, and then a last, a last point is, I'll second Jackie's point about um, the organic chemistry is, is do a control reaction to make sure that mm -hmm. your olefin is in walking out to an aldehyde. It's not polymerizing. Um, it's not undergoing an oxidation reaction. Uh, because as, as Lou mentioned, um, at NMR, the peaks don't get, they don't disappear. Um, it, it's just, they're getting broader. So at least, at least in our chemistry all the time, we'll go, there has to be an olefin. And they go, ah, it got brominated or something like that. So um, I, I think it is worth mm -hmm. just double checking and control there. Yeah, no, no, it should be there because it's a reaction based on literature and they show everything and it's just a sterification, no aldehyde, yeah. nothing at all. So if, they, you don't, if you don't do it yourself, it's I don't not trust the same. It. I know. Yeah. I, I learned that in the, in the hard way. I don't trust anything yeah, the other anymore thing until is, I'm able to do it. Yeah, the other thing is, um, you know, try mixing a solvent in. Can you put in THF or, or acetone? And that I, would dissolve, that, that might that might shift your micelle way up. And then you, if you just want the chemical structure and you know, if it's got impurities or something, then that might be better than, that might be easier than temperature. And it's, you know, solvents I, aren't I, cheap, but NMR time is more expensive usually, so. I have to try that because uh, so far I tried with the DMSO and a mixture of water DMSO, but it was terrible. Yeah, try it. I would Terrible. maybe try acetone or THF or maybe other people have, but if it's aliphatic like that. THF yeah. might work because uh, polymer is not soluble on any organic solvent. It hates right. them all. But just mix, just mix some in with the water. No problem with having two solvents, right? Mm, yeah, well, I have to ask uh, the, um, our technician. She's, she's very, very good and probably she can Shouldn't help me. Problem, because yeah. I try with the with a mixture of solvents, but it was just a quick test. And then I, I, I it's not that I gave up. I, I decided to give it a break and then rethink before attacking because I have a multiple options that I'm exploring. Yeah. So it's like, okay, let's put this one on hold and may, maybe something will come up at some point. But uh, thank you. I have uh, loads of notes <laughs> to work with. Yeah. Let us know okay. if, it, if it works out and you see that alkene. <laughs> I will. All right. Well, I think this has been a great panel. I'm going to hand it back over to our Ivan uh, planning team, Dave. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so there are no, whoops, I'm facing the wrong way here. So there are uh, no more questions. So um, it, with, if that's the case, I'd like to thank everyone for being here and also thank everyone and send John's thanks. He would usually talk for a little bit more. And, um, and this has been a really great meeting. And um, I started out doing polymers, polymer NMR. And so I've enjoyed listening to the discussion. Uh, so with that, um, I'll conclude the meeting. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thank you to the panelists.